Well, good morning and uh, welcome to our service here uh, at the Tron this morning. We'll be starting in just a moment or two. Perhaps you'd join me for these last few minutes as the musicians play, as we have an opportunity to quieten our minds and hearts and focus on God and his word, that we might hear it and respond with all of our hearts. The psalmist says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We're going to begin by singing a version of that psalm, number 90, in our blue books. O Lord, our God, in every age, our home upon the earth. Number 90.
as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. O Lord, we bow before you, the everlasting one, the one who was before all things and who will be when all that we see in this world is no more. Lord of time, Lord of eternity, king of this age and king of every age, you are the great Lord of hosts. A thousand years for you is indeed but a moment, but a watch in the night. And yet, Lord, you have stooped to draw near to us, to give us life, to give us existence in time and on this earth, that we might seek you and know you, whom to know is life everlasting. And we are but frail fresh. We are so feeble without your preservation and your care moment to moment we would indeed fade away as these bodies shall one day return to dust the dust that we are made of and nothing in our greatest power or wisdom or might or strength or understanding nothing that we have can do anything to change that and yet in your great mercy and by your great power you have promised your children a future you have promised us an everlasting future in your near presence restored in wonder restored to be what you have willed us to be true sons and daughters of yours for all eternity to be bright images of your precious son the lord jesus christ and so you've called us lord to follow him to heed him to take his path on that road to glory everlasting and so, Lord, our prayer this morning is those who gather in the name of Jesus Christ. Our prayer is that you would strengthen us and guard us and keep us. Keep us watchful, lest we should be by the cares of this life led away from him, closing our ears to his words taking our eyes from him and turning them to ourselves. And keep us wakeful, we pray, Lord, always, always awake to hear and to heed the words of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And through his strength, through his might, and by the power of his guiding word, we might indeed be those who endure to stand and not to fall on that great day when we stand before this throne set in heaven and see with our own eyes the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King and the Lord of Lords. So hear us, Lord, we pray this morning as we gather together, knowing our need, knowing our frailty, knowing our emptiness, but confident in your power, confident in your willingness to draw near to us and conscious that in you, our great Savior, is all that we need, all that you've promised to bring us into your glory. So draw near to us, Lord, we ask, as we draw near to you in faith, for we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, a very warm welcome uh, indeed to all of you this morning, whether you're upstairs here or downstairs. I hope that you can see and hear. And uh, for those of you downstairs, I look forward to seeing you 
uh, after the service. Can I uh, draw your attention to these sheets? You should have received one on the way in or found one uh, on your seat. Uh, there's a, a few things in there uh, this week. You'll see that there is uh, the monthly prayer news. Uh, and this month we have details from Roy Murray, our prayer partner uh, working in South America. So that's to help us all as we pray particularly for Roy uh, this coming month. You see also there's a white sheet with details of our harvest offering. And uh, during the Sundays in October, we have an opportunity to give particularly uh, towards this project, which is related to the Delhi Bible Institute in India, where we have a, a strong connection. And um, you'll see here that uh, their uh, goal of opening ashrams, Bible training centers in each of the states in North India uh, is almost is well over halfway there. And uh, the latest uh, attempt here in the Punjab uh, requires this new building. And uh, we're very keen to try and uh, do all that we can to add our uh, funds to funds that have already been promised uh, so that this might be uh, built and uh, or rather bought uh, for the work of Christ there in India. So please do read that and uh, uh, bring your gifts uh, marked in envelopes uh, during this month. And we hope very much that we can uh, give very generously. Just one or two things on the uh, main notice sheet. Lots of things going on this week. You'll see uh, in the evenings, uh, Bible studies, uh, Tuesday for Farsi, Thursday for uh, students and young workers and other internationals. Uh, please note on Wednesday, being the first Wednesday of the month, it is our uh, fortnightly prayer meeting. Do come along at 7.30. That's when we give voice together to all of our prayers, not just for our work here, indeed, mostly not for our work here, but for our prayer partners around the world. Uh, a very, very important time, so please do make that a priority. Then on the right-hand side, uh, you'll see that uh, at the bottom there, Scott and Doc Murray, our missionary partners, have come to the end of their home assignment very rapidly, it seems to us, and will be heading back this week. And so we want to have them very much in our prayers, and a little later on, we will indeed uh, pray for them at the front here. But uh, please do be remembering them as they pack up and get ready to go back uh, to all that awaits them at the River Kwai Christian Hospital. Then one last notice that is not, I think, in the sheet, and that is a date for your diary. The 28th of October, that's the last Wednesday of this month, uh, we will be having a congregational meeting. It'll be a very important meeting because we hope to outline to you at long last uh, some of our plans for expanding out of this building to our new building that we hope to have very shortly at the Henrywood Hall in a little bit further west from here and uh, we want to uh, give information about that and start thinking about as a congregation how we're going to do that starting a new morning congregation a new service uh, elsewhere and many other things besides so it's a time of uh, change a time of a vision a time of excitement for us something that we all need to be involved in so please put that date in your diary and uh, make sure that you're here so that you can hear all about it and then together as a congregation, uh, we shall be beginning to prepare uh, for this new uh, missionary endeavor. Well, I'll leave you to read the rest of these notices. Please do that and uh, turn them into prayer as we pray together for all that's going on in the life of the church. But uh, we're going to turn now to our reading this morning. And we're back in Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 21. If you have one of our Blue Church Bibles, you'll find that on page 880. And we're going to read this morning Luke 21, verse 5, to the end of the chapter. And it's the last uh, section of uh, this particular part of Luke's gospel that began at chapter 19, verse 28. And you'll see there's uh, typical little summary sentences at the end of the chapter. So Luke 21, verse 5, when some were speaking of the temple and how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, Jesus said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they asked him, teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, watch that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified. 
For these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be great earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilences. And there'll be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. And you'll be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it, therefore, in your minds not to meditate beforehand on how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You'll be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But not a hair on your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, for there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles or by the nations until the times of the nations are fulfilled. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars and on the earth, the stress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding for what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, Straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they come out in leaf, you see for yourselves and you know that the summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Every day he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and lodged on the mount called Olivet. And early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. Amen. May God bless to us this, his word. Well, we're going to sing a hymn now that uh, echoes Jesus' words here, number 511, lo, he comes with clouds descending once for favored sinners slain. We'll sing number 511, but we'll omit uh, verse 3. So verses 1, 2, 4, and 5 of number 511.
Well, our uh, offerings uh, for the Lord's work will be received in a moment as the uh, musicians play. And uh, you might like to use the time in the quiet to read again these words, uh, not the easiest of words that we'll be studying uh, shortly. I forgot to say, uh, congratulations to Johnny Miss Campbell and Louise Dixon on their engagement, hot off the presses uh, yesterday. We're delighted for them. Uh, and also, I believe that Lynn Brownlee is engaged as well to her fiancé, Johnny Rennie. So it's all happening, and you heard it here first. Well, our offerings for the Lord's work will be received. Scott and Nock, would you come and uh, join me here? Scott and Nock are heading back uh, early this week, following their short home assignment here, back to Thailand and uh, to the River Kwai Hospital. And as Scott was telling us on Wednesday evening, uh, there are already patients lining up outside the operating room, waiting for his return. And uh, there'll be plenty of things awaiting uh, your plate as well, uh, Nock. But we want to take this opportunity to pray very specially for them uh, as they go back. And so let's pray together. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the great privilege that you give us of partnering with so many of your servants throughout this whole world, seeking to go with the message of the Lord Jesus Christ to prepare the peoples of this world for the great day of his return that on that day there will be, as you have promised, people from every tribe and language and nation gathered before your throne and praising together the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the ministry that you have given to Scott and Nock over these many years in the land of Thailand. We thank you for the love that they have for the Thai people for the desire that they have to bring them not only healing of body, but above all, the glorious good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, which alone can bring resurrection of the body from the dust of this earth and the life everlasting that you have promised to all those who know and love you. We thank you, Lord, for the many years of service at Manorum Hospital and more recently at the River Kwai Hospital. Thank you for all that they've been able to share with us in their time on home assignment, showing us all these pictures of their work, telling us of all that goes on day by day in the hospital, and not only there, the many associated ministries, caring for the poor, the dispossessed, 
of helping those who are disabled to be able to le- earn a living and to manage and uh, support themselves. The work of training for nurses and other various medical practitioners. We pray, Lord, for the onerous load that falls upon Scott's shoulders, not only in the operating theater, but running the hospital and planning for the future. We commit into your hands, Lord, all the plans for the prospective new hospital. And we ask that in your good providence, you would guard and guide the work of River Kwai, that none of these plans would cause them to deviate from the task that you have given, and that you would set aside all that is not of wisdom and prosper all that is truly of you, that they might have confidence that your work will continue and grow and advance, and through it, your kingdom in that part of the world. We pray very especially, Lord, for Nock as she leaves Kara behind here in Glasgow, returns home knowing that she will be so far away from her beloved daughter. We pray that on this occasion especially, you would be near to both of them and to Scott also, that you would give them an assurance of your love and care, looking after her here and of the many who will love her and care for her in your name. We pray for the boys up at school in the north, and we ask also for them that you would encourage and bless them and help them in their distance from parents and in all that they endure for the sake of the gospel work there in Thailand. Lord, as we look at our world today, as we read our newspapers and see in so many parts of the world all the things that you have told us to expect, wars, rumors of wars, famines, great upheaval. How we thank you that you have also told us that your gospel will be preached in every nation and only then can the end come. So Lord, we commit to you all in this land and in every nation of the earth who goes with the gospel of Jesus Christ And may you go with Scott and Nock, giving them energy, giving them confidence, giving them a love every day for you and for your word, that they might serve you more nearly every day that passes and know the blessing of your presence and see with their eyes the power of heaven impacting this earth. So Lord, we commit our dear brother and sister to you and their whole family all who will especially miss them in their return, and all who will be joyful and delighted to see them back in the hospital in Thailand. Go with them, we pray. Grant them traveling blessings, and grant them a renewed vigor and zeal in the work, knowing that none of their labors are in vain. And the great day itself will declare all the fruitfulness of which they've been a part here in this earth. So bless them, Lord, we pray. And help us also in our commitment to pray for them and all of our other mission partners, that together we might be a people walking shoulder to shoulder in the truth of the gospel of Christ and for his glorious kingdom of mercy and grace and power. And we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, before we come to God's word then, we sing the hymn on the screens, which is our prayer. Our Father God, who dwells in heaven, draw near and hear your children.
Oh, would you turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, page 880, if you have one of the uh, Blue Church Bibles. You can see from the little summary statement in verses 37 and 38 that this is the end of another of Luke's sections, began in 1938 with Jesus' entry to Jerusalem. And it's dominated by teaching in the temple and teaching about the temple. The very heart of Israel's experience as God's people was the temple. And Jesus comes as Israel's king, first of all, offering peace. But, of course, he is rejected and resisted even by his own chosen people. But he is Lord of the temple, and he will not be denied that lordship. And as we saw in the vineyard parable in chapter 20, the time will come when the owner will take away that vineyard. He will take away his chosen fruit-bearing household for the world, and he will give its ministry to others. Jesus is very clear. Israel will lose its place to the Gentile nations of the world. But Jesus, of course, is Lord not only of Israel, but also of all the nations and all the ages. And as we saw that last time in the psalm that's quoted in chapter 20, verse 43, he will reign until all of his enemies are put under his feet, and he will sit as judge on the whole world one day. And so in this last uh, section of Jesus' discourse, we shouldn't be surprised that Jesus reminds us very clearly that he is the king who at last will come with power power which cannot be resisted. Those days will come, the great day of the Lord, the great day of judgment, and indeed it is near and it is about to be felt beginning on the earth. What will that mean for the people of Jesus' day, the Jews of Jesus' day, and what will it mean for the world? Well, back in chapter 17 at verse 20, Jesus has already said that the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. The kingdom is already in the midst of you, he says. The kingdom is where Jesus the king is. And yet there, immediately, he did go on to talk about the day when the Son of Man would be revealed, a day still in the future. And he told parables, didn't he, that clearly implied uh, a delay before that final judgment. Talked about the persistent widow, do you remember? who kept praying and waiting. And in chapter 19, there was the parable of the ten miners, about the king who went away and then returned suddenly to judge those who had rejected him. And then in chapter 20, the parable of the tenants. Again, the same message. There is a judgment that is still uh, to come. And so here, Jesus returns to that theme and explains it uh, much more fully. You get similar versions in Mark 13 and in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, where it's particularly expanded. And each writer has uh, their own particular emphasis, which is governed by uh, their own particular gospel aim. At first sight, when we read this chapter, though, it, it seems quite daunting, seems a bit confusing. But in fact, I think Jesus is really quite logical in his teaching. And Luke, of course, as we know, is very careful in his ordering uh, of what he records in order to make clear the message that he wants to make clear. And I think the main issues are very clear indeed. The critical phrase, the key phrase, is there in the last line of verse 9. The end, that is, the end of this world and its judgment, will not be at once. There will be a period, as the psalm quoted in verse 43 of chapter 20 said, until uh, all God's enemies are put under his feet and there is a final consummation uh, of judgment. With Jesus' death and resurrection and his ascension to sit at God's right hand, the new age, the end of the ages, was near. The kingdom of God is drawing near. That's Jesus' phrase often. And the gospel age means that the long-awaited judgment of God, the day of the Lord, has begun, just as the prophets constantly predicted and proclaimed. And as the prophet said, judgment begins at the house of God. That's why it's no surprise that it's the admiration of God's house, the temple here, that gives occasion for this whole discussion. It will be totally destroyed, says Jesus in verse 6, something which to any Israelite would surely signify quite literally the end of the world. 
And that's why in verse 7, the disciples ask, well, when will this be? What will be the signs that this is going to happen? Uh, in both Matthew and uh, Mark's account, it is actually phrased, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? It's not explicit here, but it's implied because, as I said, to any Israelite, the destruction of God's temple must mean that. It must mean that the new age of the world to come has begun. But Jesus answers in verse 8 and says, don't be led astray. Don't be mistaken. It won't come as you are assuming it will come. Many will come and many will assume that because of things they're seeing, that is what's happening. But Jesus says, no, the end will not be at once. There'll be wars, there'll be tumults, there'll be all sorts of horrors. Yes, there will. But don't be terrified. The end will not be quite yet. But make no mistake, the great day of judgment will surely come, both for this present generation of Israelites and for the whole evil world. This generation is something Jesus has talked about all the way through Luke's gospel. Chapter 9, verse 41, a faithless and twisted generation. Chapter 10, verse 29, an evil generation, worse than the Ninevites, worse than other pagans who repented at God's warnings. They would not. The most privileged generation of the most privileged people in the world. And yet, as Jesus had foretold in Luke 17, 25, they would reject him. They would cause him to suffer and die. Christ's uh, God's own son. So generations of prophets had been sent to woo them. John the Baptist had at last come to warn them. And then God sent his own son. And they hated and killed him. So just look back to chapter 19 and verse 43 to see what Jesus had said there. Days will come upon you when enemies will utterly destroy you. So you see here, Jesus uses that same fateful phrase, days will come when everything is going to be destroyed. And so Luke's chief focus here in the context is on the people Jesus is speaking to, that very generation. And if you look at verse 32 of our chapter, you'll see he says that is going to happen to this generation. This generation will not pass away until all this has taken place. It's more certain than the heavens and the earth. My words will not pass away. You can be sure about this. But of course, Jesus is also talking in this passage about ultimate judgment on the whole of this world. Look at verse 26. He clearly speaks about something that is coming on the world. When the world will see the Son of Man coming with power and great glory. All, verse 35, who dwell on the face of the earth. Make no mistake. So you can see Jesus has two clear horizons in view. Because the end will not be at once. And so we need to understand this whole program of God's unfolding plan and purpose for his coming kingdom. How it's going to draw near, to use Jesus' phrase, in this new age, in these last days. As these last days dawn for the world in Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension to glory. So what is the program for these last days in the earth? Which is what the New Testament calls the age that we are living in. Well, that is the question that Jesus is addressing here in Luke 21. And most importantly, he's teaching his followers what they will all experience as his people. And he teaches them what to expect in history. And above all, he's teaching them how they are to endure so that they will gain their lives. And so that they will stand vindicated before the Son of Man when he comes and escape the judgment on this world that sweeps others away into a lost eternity. Those who don't listen to Jesus, those who don't bow to his rule, those who ignore his warnings here. So let's first look at verses uh, 10 to 19, where we're told very clearly what Christ's followers will experience in the last days, in these days of Christ's rule as he puts all his enemies under his footstool. 
What verses 10 to 19 show us is a consistent pattern to the end. When the kingdom draws near with power, it will mean days of both warfare and witness for the people of God. The whole picture is one of crisis, one of great pressure, isn't it? It describes so many periods in history, not least our own day. Just look at the Middle East today with Russia flexing its muscles, with the U.S. responding, with ISIS and all the rest of it. That's verses 10 and 11 right in front of us, isn't it? It's a story of history. Because in these last days, the world is still groaning under the curse of sin. And Jesus makes plain that there will be upheaval right to the very end, both what we would call natural things, famine and pestilence and so on, and things caused by humans. But more than that, because people still rebel against God and will oppose his seed right to the very end, we will see persecution. As they hated Jesus, so Jesus says they will hate his people for my name's sake. Verse 12, people will be persecuted and imprisoned by the state for my name's sake. Verse 17, you'll be hated by all for my name's sake. Well, it's fairly grim, but remember Jesus' words back in Luke 6. Blessed are you when people hate you on account of the Son of Man. Because all of this, verse 13, do you see, is part of God's plan. This will be your opportunity for witness in the world. And verse 15, fear not, he will give you the words and the wisdom that you need when adversaries face you. Well, we read on in Luke's second book into the Acts of the Apostles, and we see that in spades, don't we? Like Acts chapter 4, where the apostles were arrested and flogged, and it led to great witness. And you see the whole church understood that and that great prayer at the end of Acts chapter 4. When the gospel causes such furore, when it causes such offense in the world, what do they pray? For boldness to go on speaking in that way. I read recently somebody uh, today saying that today we're much more likely in the church to be praying for great sensitivity for our message so that people receive it and don't get offended. But they saw that opposition and offense and persecution was opportunity for real witness with real heavenly power that none could withstand or contradict. I wonder if we need to relearn something of that in the church today. That powerful and effective witness, evangelism that really changes lives, that really grows the kingdom. That it comes with boldness born in the face of real opposition and real cost. When Jesus says in verse 15, I will give you utterance and wisdom, he means, of course, through the Holy Spirit who comes upon the church for that very purpose, for witness. We read in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, don't we? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And indeed, it is the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost that ushers in these last days, the days of witness, when the kingdom of God draws near in both salvation and judgment in the proclamation of the gospel of Christ. Now, there was a foretaste of that back in Luke chapter 10 when Jesus sent out the 72 and we're told twice that the kingdom came near into people's lives. It came near in blessing if they heard and responded. It came near in judgment if they rejected. And Jesus said then, do you remember, he who hears you hears me and the one who rejects you rejects me. And so it is in these last days, in that ultimate sense. Jesus said back in Luke chapter 12, that of his own ministry, even blasphemy against the Son of Man to his face could still find forgiveness, but not blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That is, the testimony of the apostolic gospel through the Holy Spirit bearing witness to the resurrection of Jesus and calling people to repent. People's response to the message of the finished work of Christ will be utterly decisive, according to Jesus. But note what Jesus says of this common experience of the last days 
for his people, his spirit-filled people, living in this age of the spirit, the age of the witness of the church. It'll be an age, he says, of warfare, struggles, persecution, state opposition, and great pain, verse 16, betrayals, look at that, even from family, loved ones, friends, even violence and murder and hatred from the nearest and dearest for those who love Jesus, an age of warfare, and yet of witness, of wisdom, incontrovertible, and of power that is irresistible. Losing friends, yes, losing livelihood, even losing lives on this earth. But, verse 18, protected utterly for the life that is everlasting. You will gain your lives forever. That's the real spirit-filled, victorious Christian life in this age of the Spirit, according to Jesus. Very different, isn't it? Very different from what some people would have you believe power ministry is and spirit-filled ministry. Health and healing and prosperity and ease. Not that. Swooning around with sentimental worship. Not that, says Jesus. But rather battles, struggles, wounds, scars of warfare. Jesus' call is to blood and toils and tears and sweat and endurance to the very end. That's how he says we'll gain our lives for eternity, verse 19. That's what lives of Christian witness will look like and experience. As one writer puts it, the summons to Christians is to proclaim the gospel in the midst of crisis conditions and to recognize that crisis times are for the Christian, not times for wringing hands and moaning in distress, but for being up and doing in the service of the word. And that's what true followers will experience in the last days, says Jesus, if indeed they are following the real Lord Jesus Christ. Remember Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 16? A wide and effective door for witness has opened to me. Witness. And there are many adversaries. Warfare. Now, friends, I think we need to be bucked up, don't we, by Jesus' words here, because we live in a generation that has become very, very soft, especially men. I think this must be the softest generation of Christian men there's ever been in the world. I was thinking about that last Saturday when we had the uh, OMF celebration here, uh, 150 years of the China Indian Mission, thinking of uh, Hudson Taylor and some of these early missionaries and their sheer grit and determination and understanding of sacrifice. They knew many of them. They were going to their deaths. So many of those missionaries, they gave their health, they gave their lives gladly in the service of Christ. I couldn't help thinking, well, where are all these real men today? Many of us think we're doing God an enormous favor. We just turn up once on a Sunday for church. We're far too tired to come out again in the evening. Goodness, we have a terribly hard life today. Never mind doing anything or, or saying anything that would ever cause uproar or unpopularity at work or offense. Oh, Lord, please help me to be sensitive. I wonder if there's ever been any cause for us to be hated by all for Jesus' sake. Jesus isn't saying we're to be offensive people. That's a very different thing. What is it that makes people hate? I think we're really rather feeble and soft today. How are we going to cope if verse 16 ever actually physically happened to us? But Jesus says that is the kind of experience that we should expect in these last days. Certainly if we're to be involved in real witness, in effective witness, the kind of witness that can't be withstood, the kind of witness that is with power, Maybe we better stop singing the Lord's Prayer because when we sing, Thy kingdom come, this is what we're praying for. These are the birth pangs, as Matthew calls them in his version, the birth pangs of the kingdom of God. You can't give birth, can you, without real pains, labor pains. 
And Jesus says, no, and my kingdom of power cannot draw near without pains. Look at these verses, perils, adversaries, persecutions, hatred, but also proclamation and wisdom and power and salvation, warfare and real witness seem to go together for Jesus. That's genuine discipleship in the last days. But make no mistake, these birth pains will bring to fruition God's purpose and plan to vindicate his name, to bring vengeance on his foes, on all of those who reject his son. And so verses 20 to 28, Jesus moves on to speak about what Christ's followers are to expect in these last days, the days when Christ judges his enemies. And he gives in these verses two clear predictions of the end. First of all, in history for Israel, and then upon history for the whole world. And in both of these, he says, there will be vengeance and vindication for the Son of God. First of all, verses 20 to 24, look to the near horizon and to a coming judgment on Judea and on Jerusalem. Now, the prophet Daniel, in his vision, foresaw a time when the anointed one, the Messiah, would be cut off and there would be a destruction following in Jerusalem and the sanctuary and the temple, and there would be a great desolation, and there would be war to the end. And Jesus says in verse 20, that is exactly what will happen. As I said, he's already spoken in chapter 17, and he's given the reason, because they reject Jesus, their own Messiah. They blasphemed him, they rejected him. So great was Jesus' mercy that he was still going to give them yet another chance. Remember the parable of the fig tree in chapter 13? Chop it down. No, let's give it one more chance, another year. Fertilize it. Give it every opportunity to bear fruit. And so after Christ has been crucified, even by his own, and risen and ascended to heaven, what does he do? He sends his apostles. To whom? To preach the gospel to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. Even now, offering repentance. That was Peter's message on the day of Pentecost. This Christ whom you crucified, God has raised and made Lord of all. So repent, therefore, for the forgiveness of your sins. This promise is still to you and to your children. And praise God, some of them did repent and receive the word. But in the main, the Jewish nation did not so. They rejected him and refused that salvation. They blasphemed the Holy Spirit, come to them, offering mercy, offering grace. They refused God's forgiveness, and therefore only wrath, self-inflicted wrath, only that could possibly remain for them. For a generation given nothing but privilege, and yet showed in return nothing but perversity. And so God's judgment would come, verse 22, as it is written. What Moses promised, and the curses for a people spurning God's covenant, what the prophets repeatedly echoed, what Jesus himself affirmed so solemnly. Verse 23, do you see? Wrath. Wrath against that generation. Swift and terrible. Make no mistake, says Jesus, it will come. And if you don't listen to me, and if you don't flee... Don't think that you can be saved. And God withdraws the blessing of his presence. See, there comes a, a time when the point of no return has been passed for God's household, when he departs, when his protection is, is no longer there for those people. And if that was so for the covenant nation of Israel, how much more so for Gentile churches? who bear Christ's name by adoption into his family. That's what Paul says so clearly in Romans 11. If God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. That's a very solemn word, isn't it, for any Christian institution today that flouts the lordship of Jesus Christ, the King and the Lord. And yet, look at verse 24. Even such a cataclysmic judgment on Israel is not the end of the world. <clears throat> It's not the end of God's plan. Indeed, in God's 
extraordinary providence, it serves his plan for the times of the Gentile nations to be fulfilled. And that too is what Paul explains so wonderfully in Romans, that the Jewish rejection of the gospel brings about reconciliation for the nations of the world. And the gospel has gone out into all the world just as God purposed it should. And only at last, when his plan for all the nations is fulfilled, only then will come the final end, the end of all things when the Son of Man returns, as he surely will, which is what verses 25 to 28 speak of. The end will not be at once, Jesus says. There will be a judgment on this generation and this nation for its rejection of the Son of God, but one day... There will be the greater seas. There will be judgment upon the whole earth. And you can see there's clearly a change of focus at verse 25. Jesus is talking here in cosmic terms about the whole earth, about the distress of nations, the Gentile nations. And the final end comes, verse 26, upon the world, upon the whole cosmos. They will all see, he says, verse 27, the coming of the Son of Man in a cloud with power and glory. That is exactly the language Jesus used back in chapter 17, where he described his coming as like lightning, observable by everybody. Nobody can miss it on the great day when he is revealed. And only then, as he says here in verse 28, is our true redemption near. He means the redemption of our bodies. When the whole world is released from its bondage to decay, and the whole creation obtains the freedom of the glory of the children of God, as Paul puts it in Romans 8. Only then will our heads be lifted up forever, and we'll walk tall as true and new human beings, restored bodily to the image of Christ. Only then, only when these ting things take place, at the great coming of the King with power and glory, so you see, what Jesus is doing in speaking to his first century disciples in Palestine is telling them what to expect in the last days, in the days of the end times, inaugurated with his death and resurrection. The end will not be at once. There'll be a long experience of warfare and witness for the people of Christ, but there will be vindication for the person of Christ, first in a terrible judgment on that generation of Israelites, and at last, in a great judgment on the whole world at Jesus' return. So that's the what, if you like, that Jesus has given us. And because Jesus is a teacher who is seeking a response, now, having given us the what, he turns to the so what. He's announced the coming judgment, and now he turns to applying that message to his hearers. Because that's the whole point. He wants people to be prepared for that coming judgment. That's the thing Jesus wants us to do. And so just as he has announced two clear predictions of coming judgment, so now he addresses each in turn to teach his followers how Christ's followers are to endure the coming judgments of the last days. And these last two paragraphs, verses 29 to 33 and 34 to 36, focus on careful preparation for the end, what we must do. Because whether it's that generation Jesus is speaking to or subsequent generations, he's very clear that judgment will be faced by all that dwell on the face of the earth. And so there must be, among all his people, there must be watchfulness and wakefulness. That's what marks out true saving faith, faith that endures. It's faith that hears and heeds the words of salvation. So first, verses 29 to 33, Jesus says, Be ready in this generation for the fulfillment of what is written, the judgment on Jerusalem and on its temple and all the desolations that must follow. What's coming on this generation, verse 32, is utterly certain. People living today will live to see it, Jesus says. Heaven and earth themselves are more likely to pass away and that my words about this will not be fulfilled. Make no mistake. That's what he's saying. And it happened exactly as it was written. Historians tell us in AD 70, 
The Romans sacked Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. They burned the city. They slaughtered vast numbers of people in, a, in an invasion of terrible brutality, terrible ferocity. And Jesus says to his followers, you need to watch out for the signs of that day coming. And when you see them, you need to know that that is what's going to happen. Don't think you can escape that unless you respond to what I've said. Verse 21, unless you flee to the mountains, unless you escape that coming disaster. Don't stay in Jerusalem and just pray to God for deliverance. Get out. I see Jesus' instruction is very clear, isn't it? Verse 29. There will be visible signs, just like the leaves of the tree are seen and tell you that summer is near. Well, so you are to look, verse 29. Verse 31, see these things. What are they to see? Well, what they're to see in verse 20, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. Three times Jesus used that same word, see, means see with your eyes. Pay attention to the world and its history and act according to my warning and save your lives. And history tells us that many Christians did do precisely that. They escaped that terrible slaughter because they listened to what Jesus said. But no doubt some of them didn't and perished. Just as when way back at the Passover in Egypt, it was only those who actually did what God said by putting the blood actually on the doorposts that were saved and the destroying angel it went past. See, sometimes Christians are very foolish when they think about God's guidance. They want from God some very special, personal, miraculous sign, especially for me, to tell me exactly what to do before I act in obedience to what God has already clearly said I must do. Well, anybody who was in Jerusalem and saw those Roman armies approaching and then said to themselves, well, I haven't had a clear word from God about what I should do in this situation yet. Um... I'm not sure whether I should really forsake this God-forsaken city. Perhaps I should stay and try and be a good influence here. Perhaps I should stay and help things for the future. After all, this is Israel. This is God's national standard bearer. God can't possibly desert Israel. Well, friends, let me tell you, anybody who thought like that and did that was destroyed by the Romans. And Jesus here gives them a warning and tells them how to escape, how to endure in the coming judgment. And it's not by prayer, it's by action. And of course, the apostles tell us, don't they, very plainly, that God has given us, in his word, everything that we need for life and godliness, everything that we need to know how to endure and how to escape just such judgments in time and history. As, for example, when earthly temples and institutions have passed the point of no return. Listen to what Paul says to the Ephesian church. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, sexual immorality, impurity, idolatry, because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, don't associate with them. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Flee from them. Well, God made it clear that judgment was coming in history for that generation. And he told Israel what to do, what to look for, and how to act and escape. But as real as that was, and as pertinent as those warnings were for those first listeners to Jesus, of overwhelming importance to him was the ultimate judgment that Jesus also promised as absolutely certain for all in this whole world. For all eternity, at Jesus' return. And if that coming historical judgment upon Israel required careful preparation, then how much more so the judgment that every human being will face? As Jesus says in verse 35, all who dwell on the face of the earth. And the historical fulfillment of that judgment in AD 70 surely makes the certainty of that coming final judgment even more incontrovertible. And so Jesus ends, you see, in verses 34 to 36, telling all his followers how they're to prepare for that great day. And again, he says, we must watch. But do you see what a different kind of watching 
this is. For that first specific judgment in history, there would be things to look for with your physical eyes. Roman armies approaching. And they were to pay attention to world events. And that would tell them when to act. And this is a very, very different kind of watching here in verse 34. Jesus gives no signs in world events to trigger action at a specific time. Please note that well. All through the ages, many Christians have made absolute fools of themselves by searching for signs of the end of the age, certain dates, certain things like the millennium, certain things in history, signs in the stars, all sorts of things. And they've acted upon them and made Christians look like absolute cranks. Now, what does Jesus say in verse 34? Don't watch the stars. Don't watch the European Union. Don't watch the nations. Watch yourselves. Watch lest your eyes be too much on this world and your hearts be too immersed in this world. Giving yourself up to self-indulgence, to dissipation and drunkenness, to dissolute living. Or, he says, just to be too focused on the cares of this life, just the normal things, the good things in this life. Our families, our jobs, our friends, our loved ones, our career progress, our ambitions, our promotion, our education, our music, all these things. Be careful, says Jesus, that you're not so immersed in this world's cares that that day comes upon you suddenly like a trap. The day, verse 35, that will come upon all on the face of this earth. When we stand before the Son of Man, it'll come suddenly, it'll come ex unexpectedly, just as Jesus had said back in chapter 17. Just like in Noah's day, when life was going on absolutely as normal, and then bang, judgment fell. And nobody was ready. No one on the face of this whole earth, says Jesus, can avoid that judgment whether it's those alive at Jesus' return or whether we die first and find ourselves just like that before the judgment seat of Christ. And so the question above all other questions is verse 36. Will we be found standing that is vindicated before the Son of Man or will we fall under his judgment because we're not prepared for that day? Jesus said in verse 19, it's those who endure who will stand, who will gain their lives. He talks here in verse 36 about having strength to escape through these judgments that are to come. But how? How do we prepare for that day? Well, emphatically not by paying attention to the world and looking for visible signs like cranks and fleeing to the mountains. We're 2,000 years too late for that particular response. It won't work. No, we're to pay attention, says Jesus, to ourselves. Be watchful and be wakeful. Watchful, verse 34, that this world doesn't consume us and steal our hearts and blind our eyes to the reality of eternity and the life to come. Watchful in turning away from this world and its ways and its lies and its false promises and its assurances. Turning our back on this world, denying this world. Isn't that what Jesus says? Deny yourselves. That's all summed up in one little word that the Bible uses called repentance. It means turning away from yourself, from this world and its desires, decisively, and day after day after day to the very end. Watchfulness. And wakefulness, verse 36, awake, alert at all times to the world to come, to the eternal world and to the eternal King and Lord himself. And so prayerful, in touch with God, crying out to him decisively and day after day after day for strength to endure, to endure to the very end and to be found firm, standing before the Son of Man on the great day of his appearance. Watchful, lest this world consume us. And so turning our back on its siren voices in the denial of true repentance. And wakeful at all times, awake to the Lord himself, hearing his voice, heeding his call to follow him. That's what the Bible calls faith. 
daily repentance and daily faith. That's how you endure to the end, says Jesus. And that's the only way to prepare for the coming of the Lord Jesus, the King who will come with power. By your endurance, says Jesus, you will gain your lives. The end will not come at once, but that day will come upon all who dwell on the face of the earth. So are you ready for that day? Or is that day going to come upon you as a trap? See, verse 37 tells us that all those people heard Jesus day after day after day saying these things in the temple. But many of them, perhaps most of them, perished in AD 70. Maybe you've heard it all before as well. Maybe you know it all very, very well. You've heard it day after day, week after week in this temple. Jesus says, watch out and wake up. Lest that day come upon you suddenly as a trap. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your words of gracious and merciful warning to us of the reality of your right and true anger against sin and rebellion in our hearts and against all hatred and denial of your lordship and your sovereign rule over all this world. We know, Lord, that you will come in power to judge and to justify And so we pray that you would keep us watchful and wakeful day after day after day, turning away from all that this world would ensnare us with and turning our hearts to you in prayer, seeking from you alone the strength that is able to make us endure. So help us, we pray, this day and every day. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing to end this morning a hymn on the screens, a great hymn of John Newton's, written to teach us of the reality. Day of judgment, day of wonders. Hark the trumpet's awful sound.
So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.